everyone, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Emily Manning, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host a Courthouse Steps decision webinar on McElrath v. Georgia. We're joined today by Zach Smith, who is a legal fellow and manager for the Supreme Court and Appellate Advocacy Program at the Heritage Foundation. Zach previously served for several years as an Assistant United States Attorney in the Northern District of Florida. Prior to that, he spent two years as an associate in the Washington, D.C. office of Cleary, Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton, which he joined after clerking for the Honorable Emmett R. Cox on the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. If you'd like to learn more about Zach, his full bio can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. After Zach gives his opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federal Society. With that, thank you for joining us today, and Zach, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for that introduction, Emily, and thank you for helping to host the webinar today. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and talk about this case. It's a pretty straightforward case, but it's an important one that adds some clarity to the distinction between where state procedural law ends and federal constitutional double jeopardy protections begin. And so I thought today what we could do, I could talk a little bit about the facts and the background of this particular case, some of the important issues in this case, and then briefly at the end, try to fit this within some of the larger trends in the Supreme Court's uh, criminal law jurisprudence uh, lately. And so this was a very short 10-page opinion that was written by Justice Jackson. It was unanimous uh, for the court, which I think shows in some ways uh, that the issues in this case were relatively straightforward. Uh, but unfortunately, the facts of this case, like many criminal cases, are very tragic. Damien McElrath was a young man, a very troubled young man who suffered from mental health issues for many, many years. He was bipolar. He was schizophrenic. He had been in and out of different programs and therapies, uh, committed different uh, relatively low-level crimes, uh, basically a very troubled individual. And unfortunately, uh, that trouble culminated on July 16, 2012, when Damien Macarith murdered his adoptive mother, Diane. In fact, he murdered her in a very brutal fashion, stabbing her over 50 times. And when asked why he murdered his mother, he said he did it because he believed that she had been trying to poison him. In fact, shortly after he uh, stabbed Diana over 50 times in the of course of murdering her, he called 911, confessed to the crime, and repeated uh, once he was in police custody that he did this again uh, because it was his belief, uh, according to him, uh, that she had been trying to poison him and harm him in various ways. Now, after investigating the case, the state of Georgia uh, actually charged him with three crimes stemming from this incident. They charged him with malice murder, which is essentially the intentional killing of another. They charged him with assault uh, for the stabbing and then for felony murder because that assault resulted in the death of his uh, stepmother. Now, the convoluted backstory to this case is somewhat convoluted. Uh, initially, McElrath waived his right to a jury trial. Uh, he agreed to a bench trial. The judge there uh, found him guilty but mentally ill on all three counts and sentenced him to life in prison. And that's something we'll encounter throughout the course uh, of this case as we're talking about it. Under Georgia law, someone can be found not guilty of a crime by reason of insanity. Uh, they can be found guilty of the crime, but then they can also be found guilty but mentally ill. And all this intermediate determination means is that the jury found that someone was able to form the requisite intent to commit the crime, uh, but they may be suffering from mental health issues so that while they're incarcerated, the Georgia Department of Corrections could, if they found it appropriate, provide that individual with certain mental health treatment. And so even though the judge uh, and the bench trial initially found McElrath guilty but mentally ill, uh, there were problems with that verdict, and it was ultimately set aside. And so when McElrath went to trial again, uh, he chose to take his case, uh, plead his case in front of a jury. And again, it was undisputed that he had killed his mother. The only real question the jury was being asked to resolve was whether he was uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, whether he was capable of forming the requisite intent to be held criminally liable for his actions. 
And so at the conclusion of that first trial, the jury found him not guilty by reason of insanity on the ostensibly the most serious charge, the malice murder charge, the intentional murder charge. But they found him guilty but mentally ill on the assault and the felony murder charge. And so because of that, Makareth appealed that decision up to the Georgia Supreme Court because it was a murder case and went directly to the Georgia Supreme Court and said that these verdicts were inconsistent, that because they were inconsistent, that essentially the Georgia Supreme Court uh, should let the acquittal stand, but vacate uh, the convictions for the assault and for the felony murder charges. Now, what's interesting about this is that Makareth argued, uh, and one of the key issues in this case throughout the litigation has been the fact that Georgia has a unique form of uh, verdict inconsistency. Uh, many states allow for inconsistent verdicts uh, to stand uh, if they're entered by a jury, meaning they may be logically in some way irreconcilable. For instance, maybe someone is convicted of conspiracy to possess drugs, but not of the underlying drug possession itself. Those verdicts are inconsistent in some ways. Uh, and states can deal with those differently. They can let the inconsistent verdict stand. Uh, they can vacate uh, the conviction on inconsistent verdicts. Uh, but most states have a mechanism for dealing with that type of problem. Georgia is unique in that they deal with inconsistent verdicts, but then they also have something that they call repugnant verdicts. And they say this is different in some ways than merely inconsistent verdicts. Repugnant verdicts are ones that cannot factually logically or legally, according to Georgia law, uh, be reconciled with each other. And so in this particular case, the Georgia Supreme Court found that McArath's uh, acquittal by reason of insanity and guilty but mentally ill verdicts were repugnant under Georgia law because someone cannot be insane and sane legally at the same time for committing the same acts. And so because of that, George, the Georgia Supreme Court said that they were going to vacate uh, both the acquittal and the conviction and remand it back to the trial court for trial. And so when they did this, McElrath raised a double jeopardy claim, saying that because he had been previously acquitted of the malice murder charge, the state could not now move forward and once again try him on that claim. And the trial court rejected that claim. It went back up to the Georgia Supreme Court. And the Georgia Supreme Court clarified uh, what, in their view, repugnancy meant under Georgia law. And they said repugnancy was different than a merely inconsistent verdict and that the effect of a of repugnant verdicts being entered was essentially the same as if a mistrial had occurred or if a hung jury had occurred, that there was never a verdict that was validly entered. Those verdicts were void from the get-go. And because there was never a valid verdict that was entered, uh, essentially, Macarus jeopardy never terminated uh, so that he could still be tried once again uh, for those same underlying offenses on those same underlying uh, charges. Now, this was a unanimous decision by the Georgia Supreme Court that found there wasn't a double jeopardy problem with doing this. But what's interesting is that one of the justices on the Georgia Supreme Court, Judge uh, Justice Pinson, who is a former uh, clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas, had a long uh, and distinguished career uh, practicing uh, appellate law in Georgia. Uh, he concurred in the the that judgment, but he did so dubitante. And for those who aren't familiar, that's uh, just a fancy Latin way of saying he concurred, but he did so doubtfully. And the reason he did that is he raised concerns. Uh, that many of the concerns that Makarath was raising on appeal, saying essentially that he found it hard to reconcile the Georgia Supreme Court's decision that inconsistent verdicts were in some way different in form, uh, uh, that Georgia's repugnant verdicts were in some way different in form than merely inconsistent ones, and that he found this hard to reconcile with the U.S. Supreme Court's case law in this area. But he said, uh, while he had these doubts, they weren't significant enough to essentially dissent and go uh, against an otherwise a unanimous decision from his colleagues. And so, of course, Makareth uh, petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court for certiorari. They agreed to hear the case. They heard oral arguments uh, back in November, and uh, they issued their opinion in this case uh, just last week. Now, some of the issues in this case, obviously, the overarching issue was whether or not Makareth could be 
tried again uh, on the malice murder charge or whether that would violate double jeopardy. But some of the uh, other issues that the court confronted in this case dealt with things such as what is an acquittal? Uh, what qualifies as an acquittal? Uh, is there some uh, uh, you know, magic incantation that has to be made, some specific form that has to be followed for an acquittal to be entered? Or uh, are you basically looking at the substance of what the jury did? And Justice Jackson, in her opinion, uh, she said that labels don't matter, that essentially what the U.S. Supreme Court is looking at uh, when determining whether an acquittal has been entered for double jeopardy purposes is looking at the substance of the decision. Did the jury make some finding that the prosecution's proof uh, was not beyond a reasonable doubt, that it fell short in some way? And were they making a determination as to the ultimate question of guilt or innocence? Uh, if they have reached those decisions, if they found that the proof was not sufficient, uh, if it went to that ultimate decision of innocence or not guilty, uh, then an acquittal uh, for double jeopardy purposes would be found. Along those same lines, one of the issues that came up in briefing and at oral argument uh, was whether an acquittal is something that is determined by state law or federal law. And essentially what Georgia was arguing throughout this case is that states retain broad leeway uh, to set the rules and procedures for criminal trials. And so many states have different procedures for what has to happen before an acquittal can be formally entered. Some states uh, require a specific jury form to be entered. Some require the foreman to sign the form. Some require all jurors to sign the form. Some require the jury to be polled uh, before a formal verdict can be entered. Others do not. And so Georgia Georgia was arguing that what is required uh, for an acquittal is essentially a matter of state law. And because under Georgia law, uh, they said that these verdicts were repugnant, no valid uh, verdict was ever entered, no acquittal uh, was entered by the jury, that double jeopardy was not uh, attached in this case. Uh, Justice Jackson, pretty firmly and directly rejected that position. Uh, she said, quote, it's well established that whether an acquittal has occurred for purposes of the double jeopardy clause is a question of federal, uh, not state law. And what was interesting, uh, you know, I think what Justice Jackson used to support her point in some ways was a very interesting exchange that took place between the Georgia Solicitor General and Justice Thomas at the oral argument. Uh, Justice Thomas uh, asked, if the malice murder charge standing alone had been brought uh, by the prosecution in this case, would that have been a validly entered acquittal under Georgia state law? Uh, and the Georgia Solicitor General said, yes, it would have. And so Justice Jackson and Justice Thomas at oral argument made the point, if that acquittal standing alone would have been sufficient, would have been a valid acquittal under Georgia state law, it's a very odd thing to say that just because there were other charges uh, where McElrath was in fact convicted, uh, that somehow that would operate, allow the Georgia appellate courts to take a second look and void uh, the previously entered acquittal, which is something that's virtually unknown in the history of American law. Typically, once an acquittal has been entered, once the jury has found someone not to be guilty, uh, that's typically an invi inviolable decision uh, that is really never overturned in almost any uh, circumstances. And part of the reason that's the case, and Justice Kagan uh, made this point at oral argument, is even when the jury enters inconsistent verdicts, we don't know why they did that, and it's not the role of the trial judge to necessarily dig into why the jury reached a certain decision. And Justice Gorsuch made this point as well, that the jury has traditionally served as a check on overbearing governmental authority. Uh, sometimes they may reach inconsistent verdicts as a matter of compromise. Sometimes they may do it as a matter of lenity. Sometimes they may do it as a check on government overreach. And so to allow the judge or appellate courts to go in and second guess that acquittal would essentially undermine the historic role that the jury has always uh, served in these situations. Uh, now, Justice Alito uh, did write a very brief separate concurrence, and the reason he wrote his concurrence was largely in response, I think, to a brief that was filed by the state of Missouri and several other states. Uh, 
And what Justice Alito was careful to point out and what Missouri and the other states pointed out in their briefs was that, again, some states have different procedures for dealing with inconsistent verdicts. And Missouri in particular, Missouri law requires if an inconsistent verdict uh, is presented to a trial judge, the trial judge actually has to reject those verdicts and send the case back to the jury for the jury to deliberate further. And Missouri was concerned uh, that if the court ruled in favor of Macarith in this case, it could call into question uh, Missouri's procedure for handling inconsistent verdicts. And so Justice Alito said, uh, and he said, this situation that the court is dealing with is very different than that type of situation. He said, quote, the situation here is different from one in which a trial judge refuses to accept inconsistent verdicts and thus sends the jury back to deliberate uh, further. He said that's acceptable. And at oral argument, again, it actually came out that Justice Gorsuch had dealt with a similar type of issue uh, when he was on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in a case called United States versus Shipley. In that case, the jury actually had entered uh, inconsistent verdicts. They had found on the general verdict form, they had found the defendant uh, guilty, but on special interrogatories where they kind of drilled down into what the jury had decided and why, uh, they entered that he was not guilty on certain of the underlying factual predicates that would have been necessary for them to find him guilty on the general verdict form. And so in that case, that federal drug case, uh, the trial judge there actually sent the case back to the jury, uh, had them try to reconcile the irreconcilable verdicts, and they returned a guilty verdict on all the charges. And Justice Gorsuch at the Tenth Circuit said that type of procedure was okay. And he, too, seemed very concerned at oral argument with making clear that this decision wouldn't necessarily impact uh, the ability of states or trial court judges to deal with that type of situation uh, where the jury uh, you know, tentatively presents a, a verdict to the judge, where the verdict doesn't make sense logically or legally, and the trial judge can send it back for the jury to deliberate uh, further. Uh, and so this has been a, a, it's a very interesting case. It's a very important one. You know, there was some question, I think, when this court case first was presented to the court, whether they would take it. Uh, and one of the reasons many had that question was because Georgia uh, was the only state that had this unique repugnancy doctrine where they tried to distinguish this certain category of cases as being somehow different from being merely inconsistent verdicts. And even under Georgia law, everyone readily admitted this was the only instance anyone could find uh, where an acquittal had actually been vacated and sent back to the trial court uh, for someone to be retried under this repugnancy theory. Uh, and so even though this was probably a one-off type of case, Obviously, the justices thought it was important enough uh, to take it up, to hear the issue, and to resolve it. And I think, again, that this was a fairly straightforward case, especially when you look at the Supreme Court's precedent dealing with inconsistent verdicts, is shown by the fact that it was a quick 10-page opinion uh, written by Justice Jackson, who, of course, is the most junior justice on the court. Now, what is interesting about this in some ways is kind of fitting this in uh, with some of the Supreme Court's other recent decisions in the criminal law area. Of course, we've seen several decisions during with white collar type issues over the past several years, uh, the Prococo and Simonelli cases. Uh, but we've also seen some uh, cases where the court has dealt directly with procedural issues, in particular as they pertain to certain constitutional guarantees. Just last term, the court decided the uh, Smith versus United States case, which dealt with uh, what's the proper remedy when someone is tried uh, and convicted in an improper venue. Can that person then be retried in a proper venue or, or is the government barred or stopped from retrying them? And the court there said, no, that's not the case. Uh, and then, of course, we've also seen the court dealing with, uh, you know, again, how the Constitution interacts with certain procedural rules that states have established. We saw a few years ago in Ramos versus Louisiana, where the Supreme Court said that unanimous jury verdicts are required uh, in state criminal proceedings, that the procedures used by Louisiana and Oregon at the time that allowed conviction with non-unanimous juries, that that was not permissible under the Constitution. Uh, we saw the court's decision in Collar versus Kansas uh, in 2020 as well, where the court said that 
uh, insanity law, the standards for establishing an insanity defense and what happens when someone is determined to be criminally insane, uh, that that is primarily an area for states to regulate and that there can be differentiation among the states in how the states deal with that type of issue. And then this is likely to be an issue that the court is going to continue to confront as well. In fact, uh, there's a number of uh, cert petitions currently pending before the court right now, asking it to review Florida's use of six-person juries. John Elwood has flagged this in his uh, relist uh, column. I think each of these cases has been relisted seven or eight times at this point. So clearly, this is an area that the court is very interested in and seems to be paying more attention to over the past few years uh, than it has uh, in recent memory, this interplay between state procedural laws and constitutional federal uh, guarantees. Uh, and so this was a very interesting case, a very important case, uh, but one I think that reinforced the court's previous precedents uh, that you know, once a jury enters a verdict of acquittal, uh, there's essentially very few, if any, circumstances where that acquittal can be vacated and the defendant retried on those same charges. And with that, uh, Emily, I'm happy to turn it back over to you and uh, answer any uh, questions that, that folks may have. Well, thank you for this great overview, Zach. And on behalf of the Federal Society, thank you for joining us. Thank you also to our audience for uh, participating. We greatly appreciate it. Check out our website, fedsoc.org, or follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you once more for tuning in, and we are adjourned. 